Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. We are joined by a special guest. He is the VP of the Think and Grow Rich Institute. He is the creator of Speak and Get Clients, and he is also the founder of High Ticket Coaching. So welcome to the podcast, Mr. Armin Shafi. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, you're very welcome. So we met about four or five years ago uh, at the My Empire networking event that I was hosting. Our mutual friend and guest of the podcast, Mr. Marcos Mendoza, was coming out. I believe he invited you as his guest. That's where we met. Uh, Over the years since then, we've worked on a ton of projects together. You've been the keynote speaker many times at my events. I've been the promoter on some of your events. And uh, You've, you've even sang on stage at my open mics. Now, people know you as I a did. powerful speaker on stage. They might not know that you have the voice of an angel, but that's the, that's the uh, topic of a different podcast. So let's dive into today's podcast. Uh, let's start with your story. You have an amazing story uh, that involves a car accident. It completely uh, shifted uh, the trajectory of, of, of your life and what you're up to now. Do you want to maybe share that with our listeners? Yeah, um, the open mic thing, man. You're never gonna let me go. Right? You're never gonna let. I only go. bring it up because I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, about five, about probably six years ago now, six or seven years ago, I was a young guy just trying to figure myself out. I was in a sales position in a company, and um, and I started hanging out with the wrong people. They were good people, wrong habits, just bad habits. And uh, being young, being driven by money and wanting to prove something and being successful, um, I focused and I did really good sales to the point where I got promoted to manager in that job. And I was like the youngest guy managing all the older guys. And so it went to my head. And because I had a lot of bad habits with those guys, we did a lot of partying and drugs and drinking and all this stuff. And one night we, uh, we decided to celebrate because I'd made the most money in, in, in ever in a one paycheck. And uh and I drove home at like three in the morning and I wasn't high or anything like that, but I was driving home, I was really tired. And uh, I ended up falling asleep behind the wheel and I drove right into a massive utility pole. And I remember when it hit, I thought for a moment, I think I'm dying. Cause you get really, you know, your body releases all this cortisol, your brain shuts off. You're just in the moment, present moment, no thinking. And you just go, I'm dying. And the car hit such impact on the right side of my car. So on the passenger side, it made my car spin and I knocked off a fire hydrant. The car landed on the edge of a hill going into a parking lot. And something beautiful happens when you have a near death experience like this, where you almost are about to get your life taken. Your brain completely stops, your mind stops, everything stops, time stops. And the only thing you, there is, is the present moment. So for the first time after having drifted and being so in my head and unconscious these months, or maybe up until that point in my life, I had this moment of complete silence where I was just still. In that, in that few seconds of it spinning, the car spinning, I'm just sitting there thinking I'm going to die. It's accepting it. Um, I feel like I woke up. And luckily, I opened my eyes. I was still alive. I actually was not damaged at all. I just had a you know, a bruised rib cage and uh, some fingers were broken. I grabbed my phone. I came out of the car. And I remember coming out of the car like, this is a brand new car I just got. My dad had helped me get it at that time. So it was a huge accomplishment. It was like three weeks I had the car. Just crashed it, totaled it. I walked out. And I thought, man, I'm just going to pay for the car. I'm going to fix it. I was a positive guy. I'm going to fix it. I got all this money. I'll fix it. And I walk out to see the car. And cars, there's nothing left for t- to fix. And half the engine has gone. Which makes me think, like, how fast was I driving that I fell asleep? My foot fell asleep on the wheel, on the, uh, on the pedal. And I remember looking down, man. I'm like, that sucks. Like, this car is gone. I was afraid to call my dad because this is what he was afraid of. It was 3.30 in the morning. I was afraid to call my family. They're like, what, are you, what the hell are you doing out this late? And, um, and all I remember in that moment is like, look, this saw everything happens for a reason. I had a choice. 
to say I'm an idiot for doing this or to say it happened for a reason. I chose that one. And I said to myself in that moment, I remember even then, I said, this is just going to be a good story to share with people one day. Because I felt so awake, I thought this is going to change everything. I, I got so afraid of almost dying, having done all the stupid shit I was doing with my friends and my friends that I'm like, I want to stop doing it. If this was actually the last moment of my life, I wouldn't be really proud of what I was doing. So I had the luxury, the privilege. I think I was gifted that experience because most people don't have that their entire life and they waste their whole life unconsciously. I got it really early on at the age of 18. And I remember looking, turn around and going, I don't want to do this. If I had just died, I would be very disappointed in how I was doing things. So I completely changed everything. And that night triggered my decision to say, okay, I realized something. I was doing all of this and becoming this way. My life was kind of going down the drain because of what? Because I was trying to earn more money. That was my justification. And I had a very wise lesson just brought to my mind in that moment. During that era, I realized during that time of self-reflection, I quit the job I was in. I left everything. I started from scratch. I remember I realized, I'm like, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how you make it that determines your life. And so even though I was making lots of money, I was becoming a terrible person. So that kind of shifted everything. And coincidentally, I said, it's going to be a good story to share with people one day. Years later, two, three years later, it turned into an entire business called the Reborn Experience, where I use the concept of my near-death experience, and I use it as a coaching process to help my clients go to the last line emotionally of them. What's the worst thing that could happen? If today was your last day, would you be happy? And because they accept the leverage of how bad that sounds, like, no, I don't want this, they change. So I use that experience of mine, the near-death and how it shifted my life to help hundreds of other clients through my reborn experience program, make decisions to change around their life, to turn around what they're doing that they don't want to do. So most people are just busy being busy. There, there's always stimulation. You're listening to this podcast, you're in the car, listening to music, you're on YouTube, uh, you're watching TV, <laughs> playing video games. There's always stimulation. And it, it, it's kind of crazy that it took this this accident, this near death moment for you to have that silence and to finally be present. And uh, there ended up being a gift in there with, uh, you know, just your shifting in thoughts and then the reborn experience that, you know, it, it it's not just about you anymore. Uh, that near death experience has, has allowed you to be a, a vehicle or a conduit to, to help others as well. Yeah. Yeah. Turn out to a good thing. I think, Everything that comes to us in life that are failures or tragedies, it always comes with the equivalent seed of opportunity. And leadership is just learning how to find that seed and nurturing it because then you become immune to failure. Nothing really ever gets you down. No matter what happens, you find something good in it and you take it and it's another step towards what you want. For me, that was the biggest tragedy I could have ever had at that age. you know. And I've had worse now from then, but again, from that moment, I learned how to find the biggest opportunity and the greatest, you know, tragic problems that happen. Um, so it's a way of living, you know. Early, early on, Tony Robbins was was an influence for you um, when it comes to be becoming a, an inspirational speaker. When it comes to running live events, what yeah. was it about about Tony that uh, resonated with you? Like resonates with millions of people. The moment. So his event was the first like seminar I'd ever gone to. Transformational. I didn't even know they existed until I went to his. And uh, at that age, I was about maybe I think 20 years old. So it was about two years later. It was before I started Reborn. And um, it's a funny story how I even got enrolled into the program. I would never spend money on a seminar. Like, I was the guy reading all the books, all the YouTube videos for free, just always trying to torrent a course online. Like I didn't want to pay for anything. Again, that's a poverty thought. Like that's that's because I didn't have money coming in. I was working all the time, but I really, really didn't know what to do with money. And uh, somehow I got sold by his team to buy this, this experience. It cost me about two grand. At that time, that was about 40% of my net worth because I already had 5,000 saved up. And uh, it was a scary thing because it's something I'd never done before. It was in a different country. I had to travel alone, bunk with some random dude to save costs and go to this four and a half day experience where apparently we're going to walk on fire. So it was quite an extreme decision. And I almost literally canceled three times before going. Three times I almost canceled over and over. I'm like, ah, and I, I tried to sell my ticket at one point. At one point I almost sold my ticket to make profit on it. And the person's on the call, gets on a different line while we're talking, comes back and goes, hey, I'm not interested anymore and hangs up. 
So God was working in mysterious ways to make sure I go there. And I showed up. And the first day and the second day goes by and I'm just thinking like, this is a lot of common sense. Like my ego is there, right? I'm like, it's a lot of common sense. I mean, it's good. I like him. He's good. He's good. He's very entertaining to listen to. And then there's parts in the seminar that he did things with us, you know, processes, exercises. And those moments is what led me to my biggest breakthrough that really started my entire career in coaching. And in essence, in a nutshell, what happened was he took us through processes that made us face probably the greatest fears we have or face and challenge the greatest limiting beliefs we have. And as a result of that, I walked out of that seminar realizing like two things. One is that there is nothing I can't do. He, he helped me like understand there is nothing I can't do. And it's just a matter of deciding what I want and working towards it. And that's it. And it's good. But by, by law of nature, I have to have it eventually. That, that released all the nets and the chains that I'd mentally put on myself or others had put on me up until that point. There are multiple excuses we make about what we can't do. I had excuses around, I was too young. I was not qualified. Who was I to even help somebody else like this, right? Or in, in the relationships, I remember I had one where it was like, well, I'm so smart. It's hard to find a girl. <laughs> it's literally one of my limiting beliefs. It's really hard to find a girl that connects with me because I'm so smart. I have such high standards some BS, man. And so he helped me reframe these beliefs. And I walked out feeling with their zero net, zero blockage, zero limiting beliefs, no more walls in front of me to get whatever I want. The second thing I realized, and this, he didn't do it purposely. He did a, I did it through observation is I looked at him. I'm like, this guy's what 55 at the time, 56 years old. I'm like, I think he's living the greatest life possible a human can live. Not only is he worth half a billion dollars. So financially he's good. He's making the most incredible impact I've probably ever seen. It's 10,000 people in a seminar changing their lives. Practically, not metaphorically, actually changing their lives, like making decisions. And he has everything a man could want. Like that, that was my perspective at the time. And I'm like, his story was that he started at 19 years old with zero qualifications, credentials. He even went to a course for two days and left. He's like, I know how to do this. And he went and did it. And he he built was this overweight. Empire. He was depressed, all those things. And his story made me realize, man, if this guy can do it, I can do it. And here's the big breakthrough I had. I'm like, what's the difference between me and Tony? Nothing. Just time. That was the biggest realization I had on top of the no limiting beliefs of my own. I realized there's virtually no difference between me, you, and anyone else to somewhere that we're not yet. It's just a matter of time. So that both those beliefs I walked out with was what built now the life I have today. I always say there's 10,000 people that went to that seminar. Not everyone walked out and built a million dollar coaching business or started traveling and living the dream. Not everyone. So what's, what's the difference between the minority and the majority of people? Is the minority probably left thinking, I can do this or I can do what I want. No BS. So that my inspiration came from watching him live, live integrably the life that most people would love to live. Balanced in all ways, harmonious, fulfilling, nurturing. It, it's amazing. So he inspired me of what's possible. And that's what started my journey. At the beginning, I even tried to model everything about him. I'd walk like him, talk like him, dress like him, eat like him, Jump sound on like a him. Jump little trampoline and, and spin a Jump. few times. I still got the trampoline. It's back there, by the way. It's right there. <laughs> it's all the guy. I don't know if you can see it. Nice. You know? Um, and that was the beginning of my confidence. I had to borrow confidence from him. I had to borrow his certainty in this by being like him. And so my message is to people that are starting out, maybe don't know who they are or don't have confidence is the fastest way to become confident is to borrow it. Find someone that is doing what you want and just model it. And borrowing that confidence, you infuse it in yourself. Eventually you gain your own momentum. Now your own confidence comes up. It goes, oh, I have my own way of doing this. And that's how I originally turned into who I am today. What I love who I am. I don't want to be him anymore. I don't want to be anyone. I don't want to be me. But that was a process. So you're the creator of Speaking at Clients. So what exactly do you do under that umbrella? Uh, pretty simple. Um, my, we did really good in the first, I'm, I've been in business in five years now going. And for the first, for the majority of that three to four years of it was just running seminars, transformational programs, selling coaching, like actual personal coaching. We'd sell Thinking Grow Rich programs, uh, my Reborn Experience programs done in different countries. And then we had Elite Speakers Academy, which you came to. Um, I've as been well, to which reborn. Was, I've been to lots reborn. of stuff. Yeah. yeah, I think you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then there was also the public speaking conference, right, for Elite Speakers Academy. And I did so, like, I somehow I built that thing up. We did, like, a million dollars in sales over the three years. I'm like, man, I can help a lot of people out. And here's what I realized. Um, when I started to go online, I was pivoting online because I wanted to reach more people. You know, I realized only 30 to 50 people at a time could come to an event. But if I can get 3,000 to 5,000 people at a time online, there's no net to how many I can help. So I started to look into that and I went there and, I, and the first thing I found out was that there was internet marketers teaching coaches how to build a coaching business, but they're internet marketers. They sell products, they sell courses, they sell like information stuff, right? They don't, not coaches. So coaches were going out there doing things that are not relevant to a coaching business, but it was working somewhat because it was marketing. And I'm starting to go out there and starting to find all the mentors. I spent like a couple hundred thousand dollars just buying everyone masterminds and programs, just trying to understand like, what is it that I need to know that I don't know? to make a huge impact online with my coaching. And I just realized everyone follows a very similar model, which is the speaking and clients model. They all have one core piece of content, like a presentation that's very strong, whether it's a short webinar, long webinar, they have something that does the selling for them. And then they get them to want to become a client. So I'm like, okay, so the key is what I was doing on stages, you got to do online as well. It's called a webinar. I would do speaking from stage. It's the same thing. So my entire goal behind speaking at clients was two things. One, to take marketing off coaches' hands permanently. How do you do that? You create a very good piece of evergreen content, like a webinar, presentation, sales video, speaking, hence why it's called speaking at clients, and let that do the selling for you so that the, the qualified people that want to work with you watch that and go, I want to be your client. As opposed to what I saw everyone doing out there and suggesting what to do is they're just going to Facebook groups and uh, Instagram and, and, and prospect people and send cold direct messages to others, getting on a call, like trying to sell your, no, 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 no. that's a job. It's not a business. That was the first goal. The second goal was so that coaches can learn from an actual coach who built a coaching business, <laughs> sold a million dollars of coaching, not information or advice or consulting or courses. And so those two things seem to be very powerful because all the clients that joined this program, they not only change their lives of their thinking, their, their thinking changes so much to become leaders, but also they create the most incredible streamlined marketing system that I've designed from learning from some of the best in the world, but niche to coaching to build a business and make a difference in the world. So that's really the, the mission behind it. And, and once they create that, that video, that webinar one time and it's high quality and it's efficient, then that can be used over and over again, right? They're now, they can, uh, they're not tied with their, their, their time and, and money, it's, it's separate, that they can have something uh, available anytime. They can do ads that get people to see them. It, it can become kind of this uh, self-running machine, which allows them more time to do what they love, which is the coaching and less time yeah. with the marketing. 100%. We're, we're essentially turning coaches into real business owners. And business owner is someone who owns a system that works for them self-employed or small business owner would be someone who trades their time or talent for money. So you got a lot of coaches, again, learning from internet marketers, how to get leads organically so that they can go and sell their time or trade their time or talent for money. And we're saying, look, if you really want to make a difference on the Tony Robbins, Brandon Bouchard, Les Brown level, you got to have automation in your process. And so we created an automated marketing system that takes all the marketing off your hands. So the only thing you're left to do is coach the clients that join your program. It's literally what we do. Um, that's literally my life right now. I have multiple live coaching calls, group calls a week with my clients. They're incredibly insightful, incredibly valuable. I still work with everyone one-on-one, -on -one, but we have an audience watching just like a seminar so they can learn as well. And the rest of the business is completely systematized for me. I don't do my sales. I don't do my marketing. I don't do my advertising. I don't do anything. I do the most important thing that no one else could replace me at, coaching the clients. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And wh why do you think it's important that everyone develops uh, public speaking skills, public speaking skills? Why is that so important? Because it's leadership. And if you're in the, if you're in, if you're in any type of leadership role, and I'd argue everyone to some degree is if you're a parent, if you're a coach, if you're a business owner, if you're a teacher, you're a leader, you're leading others. If you cannot effectively communicate your message, effectively articulate your thoughts, and do it in a way that people actually want to listen and understand and aren't entertained by it, you're, you're crippling your leadership. That's what you're doing. So how are you going to raise children if they don't listen? If you can't effectively speak to them, influence them. How are you going to build a company? You can't. 
And so um, by default, people who do not know how to effectively public speak or just speak in general, communicate well, they will follow the person who can. So if your goal, and that's okay too, by the way, but if the goal is for you to develop leadership and become someone of leader, uh, leadership in your life, well, the first thing you should be working on is communication, speaking. That makes sense. Like yeah, that, com- that's what I do. communication is everything. I mean, it's it's relationships, your family, your friends. It's, um, you know, interviewing for a job, the communication comes in everywhere. So getting that as a base level with the public speaking or being a solid communicator, uh, super important. What do you think are the top traits that the most powerful speakers in the world possess? Some traits we can aspire to develop. I'll say off the bat is entertainment, which is linked to humor. Think of all the greatest speakers you know. They're funny. The greatest, majority of them, very minority of them are very just inspiring. There's no humor to it. They're just inspiring. They, they get you emotional, which would be my second thing, by the way, which is your ability to elicit emotion from the audience. You're an inspiring speaker. If you're not funny, you better be inspiring. If you're not inspiring, you better be funny. If you can, do both, which is what I've mastered over five years. Because I realized it's the adjustability, of, it's the flexibility of knowing who you're talking to. Here, I could be a little bit funny, or I could be very inspiring. And the third is clarity, man. And clarity is built off two things, though. Being concise, brief, and being clear in your message, right? I have a whole show called Clear Talk for that very reason, because I think people's minds are so busy and confused. It cripples their results in life any type of results. If you're not clear with what you're trying to say and you can't say in a brief manner, you're not gonna communicate effectively. So someone who takes 17 lines to say one thing, usually you will lose an audience. But someone who could say one thing and make, and that means a thousand words, will capture, it will captivate every audience they speak to. So humor, so entertainment, inspiration, so the ability to inspire or elicit emotion from the audience. And the last one, is just brevity and clarity, like being concise. And that's really good communication. So secret is less is more. Jordan Peterson says that the more the speaker understands the content, the more freedom they have to have a sense of humor. He says for him, when he's joking more on stage he knows that he really understands his stuff it's like he doesn't have to be defensive because he doesn't know it all um so he says that's a good sign of a great speaker is sense of humor which means that they've prepared enough to have the guard down and to not feel like they need to be taken so seriously so that's, that's really deep i agree with that yeah i don't never thought about that but it's true like when you see someone's funny that means they're comfortable if they're comfortable that they're certain in what they're saying Apparently, certainty. Ooh, I'll bring this up. Yeah, go ahead. Certainty. If there's a fourth element, certainty. Ooh, but certainty see, encompasses all of it the humor, the inspiration, and the bre- brevity. The certainty is what you want from a good speaker. You don't want them to ever feel like if they even show a sign of uncertainty, you lose everybody. And the, but see, what is that? Leadership. Leadership is you fall someone who's more certain than you in something. Public speaker has to be certain, certain, no matter what has to display certainty in themselves and what they're saying and then what, and what, what, uh, what the audience wants. Big, huge thing. Thanks for sharing that with me. Apparently people fear public speaking more than death. Why, why do you think that is? That's, that seems a little extreme to me, but uh, apparently that's the, what the polls tell you. I used to say this in my speaking seminar. It's actually quite logical if you think about it. Why would it be the number one fear, the living fear? Obviously someone's gonna be more afraid of dying and being burnt alive. You give them an option between getting burnt alive and speaking, they'll probably choose speaking. But that's a dying fear. A living fear means you don't die after. So it's the number one living fear alive. Hmm. And here's the reason why. Think of it logically. How many fears psychologically are you battling when you speak in front of an audience? The fear of the unknown. What will happen? Will you blank? Will they throw something at you? Will they laugh at you? It's unknown. So, and that alone can take a person insane. Humans are so afraid of what they don't understand and don't know. Second is the fear of criticism. What if they don't like you? Then you got the fear of judgment. What if they make fun of you? Let alone like you, what if they make fun of you? Then you got the fear of blanking, complete lack of faith in yourself. What if you mess up? Fear of failure. Fear of failure. Look how many fears we got so far. I haven't even started. 
So you step on a stage in front of two or more people. All these fears hit you like this. Of course, you're going to be paralyzed. You're going to sit there like, uh, because you're battling so many different variables that could literally like ruin that moment for you. And there's so much more, right? So, and then you got obviously deeper social heredity. Our, our entire society, we, we get raised in an environment to be completely insecure in ourselves and don't believe in ourselves and always correcting ourselves and changing who we are and something's wrong with us. So now imagine getting on the stage again, you're getting in the spotlight of the most concentrated, you know, um, version of that, which is an entire audience is sitting there waiting for you to do something. As opposed to in an environment you grow up in and you still get criticized, you get judged, you get whatever. This is like you're asking for it because you're in front of everyone. Like, I'm about to get all your attention to do something. I can't let you down. So it's just a lot of insecurity. So on the controvert, the, the contrary side of it is this. Imagine now you get good at it. You're overcoming all the major fears a human can go through. You're developing the strongest level of confidence you could possibly develop in yourself as a public speaker. It's like, if you can master a stage, you can master any stage in life. Mm. So it's kind of the compounding of all the fears that people normally have. And it's yeah. all in, in one moment uh, at one point in time. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. What, what has been the biggest challenge for you in creating your own niche as a speaker and as a coach in such a crowded market. It seems to be getting more and more crowded, especially with the pandemic. Everyone is now a coach trying to build something online. Yeah. Um, I think the idea of saturation is smart for ec business economics, like understanding how to create something new to sell to a marketplace. You definitely have to take that into account. I think as coaches, we have an unfair advantage where one of the major um, components of the sale of a coaching client has to do with something that cannot be uh, duplicated by anyone else, which is you. So one of the major components of why someone pays you as a coach is because they probably want to work with you. And that's something that you can't, you don't have to worry about. There's no competition because there's no other you. So I think a lot of coaches don't understand in my business model, it's like, we don't think about competition. We only think about it in the sense of seeing what's already working out there. We don't ever worry about it taking away from our business. And a lot of people also overestimate how much of a problem it is. Like, it doesn't really matter. Competition doesn't matter until you're doing a million a year or a hundred grand a month with an offer. It really doesn't matter because you're not saturating enough. You're not taking enough of the market for other people that are competing with you to carry it. Right. So it doesn't actually matter. Most people's goals financially can be more than achieved operating with under hundred grand a month, a month with the coaching offer or program, not having to worry at all that there is a hundred million other people doing the exact same thing. And it's funny because we get calls like every week for my offer, for my program. And uh, we recently got someone who said, oh yeah, I just, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I like to message people to learn market research. Like, hey, like what, what, what got you away? And uh, he, I messaged him directly. I have a team call these people, right? But I talked to him directly and I said, hey man, curious, you know, what happened? You booked a call, you didn't join the program. Can I answer any questions you have? And he goes, oh yeah, I went with someone else. And I said, cool, yeah, who'd you go with? I'm just curious. Uh, I want to know like what else is out there. And he sends me a link to this guy has virtually showing no results of anyone making money with them. Virtually showing like, I'm like, so I asked him this. I go, and I actually have the text here. I said, I'll read it for you. And just so you, sh just, so I, just to prove the point, like it doesn't actually matter because in this space, this is what happens. I go, so does he uh, have a program helping coaches do 50 grand a month in their business? Cause I'm like, that's what my program's about. And does this guy do that? And here's how he responded. I believe I'll get the coaching that I'm looking for. He didn't answer my question. He responded with deflecting the question because he gets my point, but what does he tell me indirectly? I resonate with this person more than you. Okay, cool. And here's all I got from that. See, there is realities where even if the program is better, even if the result is more guaranteed with us, you'll literally still choose somebody else just because you feel like you want to work with them more. So when, you, when that's a factor, does competition matter anymore? No. You be yourself, show up authentically in a marketplace, do your absolute best to provide value, and you will attract the people that resonate with you the most. And for that reason, everyone creates their own little tiny cut of the market where people want to work with them. For example, five years ago when I started my coaching, my transformational business, 
I was literally just modeling Tony because he changed my life. I wanted to do it for others. And most people will go, oh, you can't compete with Tony. Like, why do you even think I'm competing? Tony can't get to everyone in the world. He's one person. There are thousands in my neighborhood that don't know who he is. I can get them as a client. But see, when you think like that, competition becomes relevant. It doesn't, you don't need to differentiate again, until you scale. And when you scale, you're doing a few million a year. Now, yeah, you're buying, you're competing with the market share, but everyone doing less than a hundred thousand a month or a million dollars with one coaching program, it's not a problem. So niching is so easy in the beginning of a business from zero to hundred is so easy because it's just a matter of finding the people that resonate with your messaging the most. Nowadays, it seems like everyone is a coach. They're a life coach, a health coach, a wealth coach. Uh, everyone's a coach. To me, when people say they're a coach, it just sounds like they're unemployed and trying to figure things out. So my question to you is, how can someone that is looking for coaching yeah. distinguish between the posers that are just maybe I can make money this way versus those that are documented and actually helping people and having success. Results. Results. You know how many coaches I get booking calls with us? They're like, I went through certification school. I have all these certificates. Okay. How many clients you worked with? Uh, five. Do you have testimonials? No. So the 18 year old kid who has 12 testimonials and no certifications will sell more than you. Because people buy results, not credentials. The new resume is results, not your background. So here's a good example. You can go to speakandgetclients.com slash client results. We have an entire page of every screenshot and video from all the coaches I've worked with, the money they've been making, the progress they've had, the transformations. Hmm. I just had to film 12 client interviews. 12 people who have massively grew their coaching business from working with me. People as, as, as beginner, as like had a job, was 20 and just wanted to get into coaching all the way to someone who's a 12 year doctor, wants to teach men how to improve testosterone, help them make 10 grand in 45 days by pre-selling a program that's not made yet. We have all wide varieties. And so 12 interviews, man, when I can show 12, client success stories. I have more than I'm saying I just did 12 like last month. I had to require, I have to record more now. When you show that you're not wondering what's my, what school did I go to? When I show that you're not saying what certificate do you have? Because that's just another way of masking the fact that you're uncertain. I can get you results as a coach. Cause you're hoping that a certificate somehow proves that I'll get your results. That's not necessarily true. What's the only thing that we can guarantee? No BS, you can't lie about it, is a guarantee that I can get your results if I'm doing it for others, right? And here's my, here's my entire integrity philosophy behind this. And every coach I work with, I say the same thing to them. You should be your first client. You should be a product of what you're first selling. So what did I do first before I started to sell marketing? I spent three years building a business the hard way, doing all the stuff most people have not done filled rooms with hundreds of people and did it in different countries. Spent the money, made the money, made the revenue, made the sales, made the profit. What have I gone through? Experience. I made myself a success story. Because I earned that right, I can definitely charge whatever I want to show someone how to do it. Because to them now, it's just a matter of timing. It's not a matter of if you can help me, it's a matter of do I want you to help me? And so every client that we work with, whether they be career coaches, confidence coaches, public speaking coaches, health coaches, fitness coaches, I have so many different coaches in the program. Um, I, the first thing we're teaching them is how to collect results because it doesn't even matter if you've been doing this for 20 years, if you can showcase social proof and results from clients, it doesn't matter what you know, because all it is, is a theory until I see it happen. So first you must become your own result. And then you take that and you duplicate it for others. That's what coaching is. I've gone through something. I'm trained in it. Let me help you. Right. That's how we get over that. It, it's just, it's very simple. Like you need to have results. And it's not that certifications aren't useful. They are, but they're useless without client results. And the, and the funny part is you can get client results without them. 
The only reason why you would need to go through a coaching school, not marketing for coaching, is if you don't know how to coach. In that case, yes, go learn. But still, do you know how to coach until you create results? No. And so I've had the coaches come to me and they spent 12 grand in a, in a certification program, but they're not getting any clients results or anything because they don't know how to do marketing. So the irony is because they don't know how to do marketing to get the client to do it with, they're now deemed as unqualified so far. So here's how you cut through the noise. You ask for the results, verify them, talk to their clients. You call any one of my prospects that wanted to work with me, they can literally call my students. We have that sometimes happen. And then my students like, I don't tell them to do anything. They just tell them what the experience is like. It's amazing. So results are everything. And, and so that's what you got to look for. The, the criteria I have is this. Do they have the result themselves? Do they have results for others? And have they stood the test of time? Because again, I don't want to hire a coach on something that's only done it for a month and got two people results. Sure, but it's still a month. Like maybe their method or thing is just the flash in the pan. That makes sense. And that's how I choose if I'm going to work with someone results like let me show show me what you've done how long you've been doing it, and are you guys doing it because again i've been i know people that sell very expensive coaching packages and they haven't done anything for themselves and so how can they teach someone else that the other thing is they've done it for themselves so they know how to sell you but they don't help anyone else make money it's like your students are not making money or not getting results or they just started like three months ago in that case, I shouldn't be charging a lot of money. I should be charging beta prices to prove, validate that my, my program works. That's another process that we teach in SGC. You got to validate. Integrally, you don't charge full price. You exchange that money for experience and results. In fact, in the beginning of our program, I don't even tell you to charge anything. If you do not have results, I don't care how experienced you are on what you've been doing, you go out and do free coaching. You earn testimonials. You take those testimonials, you use it and leverage it to sell a beta. Then only when you sell a discounted version of that program, do you go and sell full price after the beta as well, validate that it works. It's an integrable process to building a good foundation to a business. What's, what's your favorite professional memory with your businesses over the last five years or so? Any, any what? moment just pop up? My seminars, Reborn specifically. I think my most favorite one is the last one I did in 2019. God damn, two years ago now. Um, where specifically a woman was deathly, of, like I was hyperventilating. Um, was hyperventilating about an exercise we do where we have to essentially forego $100 to exercise the detachment of money in fear. And this person, uh, were you there, Joe? I think I was there, yeah. And um, she was a hyperventilator, you know. We had to like coach her and help her out. 200 people in the room. And without my knowledge, everybody took their money, put it in a basket and gave it to her. Cause she was, she was hyperventilated. She was like having a panic attack because to her, even the hundred dollars was like make or break for rent. And so getting to watch that audience turn around and show a sense of humanity and help her with no reason to just wanting to made me cry. It was beautiful. I have a lot of moments like this, but that was one of my favorite moments. Um, just to see people come together and help this person out. It's what the world should be made more of. People like this, moments like this. I, so I was a part of that moment. So I saw the, um, the kind of emotional support that everyone gave. And that was a, a moment in itself and talking through that with her and all those things. But I didn't know of the other end of it that people actually financially came together. In the back of the room, they were collecting a basket of money. And at the end of it, they came and put it in an envelope and said, here is like, I don't know, it's like four or five grand or something. Something like that. Because not everyone brought a hundred. They all bought like 20, 50 something. So they gave all the money to her. And it's like, that was like three months of expenses for her. So, and then we gifted her a thinking grower seminar and uh, we just really did our best to help out. But that, that moment, man, but I'll tell you, there's something that comes really close second. And it's not about the audience, more of my own moment. It's when I do my reborn process exercise. There is a moment in the reborn process that I take people through where after, you know, getting through all the, the terrible feelings, we break through. And there's a moment where I play a specific song from Transformers and the tone of that song the notes it hits, the melody, and the buildup, the inspiring buildup. I can't tell you, there's probably no feeling like it. When I'm sitting there, standing there on a stage, I'm seeing hundreds of people, 
in the state. Her eyes are closed. And I'm sitting there and I like almost leave my body and I see myself in third person. And I see myself as like this brave heart, this like leader leading the people, the revolution. Like it's literally how dramatic it gets in my mind. And I get so inspired by myself in that moment. I'm like, I'm leading this room to like break through. And the music's building up and the combination of the music and the superhero music and their like intensity. And I'm, t- and I, you know, I'm commanding them to like say, make their moves and say words so that they feel more empowered. That moment, man, I don't think anything could replace it. That's, that's, and that happens every event at Reborn. And I don't think I could ever, but I, I crave it, man. I wish we could do events. I would do them every weekend. Someday, who knows? Who knows what the new normal will be? But uh, obviously I run a lot of events as well. So both of us are excited someday to get back to those. Uh, you you have an entrepreneurial spirit. Where, where does that come from? I mean, you've developed all these skills, whether it's sales or speaking, all these skills that you could easily just bring to another company, you know, just be an employee, get hired. Uh, how, where, where does this entrepreneurial spirit come from? Well, the reason I don't take my skills to another, you know, profession is because like I said, I learned very quickly early on. Luckily, it's not about how much you make, it's how you make it. So I've been very, very specific and picky with how I choose to build my life around the money I make. And that's why I've, and I've made mistakes, obviously, in, in the years I've let money f- take me again, I come back and I, and so I make sure I constructed my lifestyle in a way where I genuinely feel amazing doing it, regardless of how much we earn. You know, it's funny, my team, every time we make new sales, in the beginning, we we're making sales and it was exciting because there's a new whole new online offer we built and they would come to me like, how do you feel? Because someone just paid in full to work with us. And I'm like, the same. They go, what do you mean the same? Why would I feel different? The only difference is someone gave us money to help them. We're still doing what we love. I don't do it for the money. So it doesn't spike my emotion. They go, damn, that was deep. I go, if you let the money spike your emotion, guess what will happen? The day you're making money, you'll be happy. Guess what happens the day you don't? Guess what happens the month that you're in in loss? Now you're sad. Self-mastery, right? The ability to control those emotions. Stay consistent, no matter what the external circumstances may be. So to me, I've just, I have strategically positioned myself in my life in a way where I'm never in a corner where I'm doing something I don't want to do just because of money. And that even goes for clients. I will kick clients out of my program. I have, unfortunately, a few times. I'm like, it doesn't matter how much you pay me. There's no amount of money you pay me to make me sacrifice my peace of mind when I talk to you. You need to work on yourself before you work on your business. And I'm like, that's not what this program's for. <laughs> that's reborn. You got to go there. My point though is I've never let any amount of money get into between me and my peace of mind and my happiness. Very important. It's a very, very important rule I think most entrepreneurs should have because they let money, they sell their soul to the money. Ooh, this makes more money. Let's go do that. But then they don't, they underestimate the amount of work, time, efficiency, backhand, support you have to build around this new thing how much time it's going to take from you and then underestimating the quality of their emotion as they do it all. And all they see is the money, short-sightedness. And they get there and they're like miserable. You know how many coaches I work with, Joe, that miserable? Man, I'm selling like this, then or not. I thought it was going to be a smart idea. Yeah, but you're not happy. And if you're not happy, guess what you don't do? Work. If you don't work, guess what you don't make? Money. So people think happiness or peace of mind is separate from money. They're very close cousins, man. If one's not happening, the other one doesn't happen. If I feel like crap, why would I feel inspired to go give more to my clients or my business? So I sabotage my business. So thinking I'm doing the thing that makes more money, but not taking into consideration my emotional state is foolish because eventually it'll catch up. I'll make less money than the person following their passion, following what they love. So I just wanted to make that clear why I don't go to other professions. I specifically stay where I love to stay, which is coaching. I love helping working with people. I'm a, I'm a performer in a sense. So coaching calls are like my stage. Um, and the entrepreneurial spirit, I guess I have a short answer for this. Very early in my life, I was introduced to network marketing. At that time, I didn't know what business was. And if there's one thing they taught me that has served me for the rest of my life is that there is no such thing as impossible. The network marketing company's entire mission is to make every one of their affiliates believe they can achieve any goals they set their mind to. Not only that, but there is a roadmap on how to do it. And that that principle got instilled in me very young 
So I very early on decided I wasn't going to go the traditional path. And I really want to make that my reality, that I can set my mind to any amount of income or lifestyle I want. And there's always a path somewhere where I can find it to get it. It was like a personal development in an indirect way. That's where it came from. Just being exposed to the possibilities by seeing other people entrepreneurially do it inspired me. Inspiration is where I got this, this attitude from. Anyone that chooses a unique career path, whether it's as a entrepreneur or network marketing or a singer, dancer, actor, poker player, anything that's unconventional, you're, you're now kind of uh, the subject of criticism. You get, you get the haters, you get people with opinions, and it's actually usually your friends and family that tend to be the worst. I mean, they, they, they picture you as little baby Armin in diapers that they want to protect, and there's probably safer ways of making money. How do you how did you get past the, the critics normally in the form of friends and family? How do you, how do you ignore the naysayers? Yeah. So that's usually only a problem in the beginning because 90% of them turn into your biggest fans when you, when you make it. They say, Oh, I knew from the start you'd be successful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got lucky, man. My, my family was quite supportive, whether they were being real about it or not when I was running my first ever seminars, not before that though. Cause they saw me take massive action when I woke up with my seminars prior to that, I tried a lot of things, man. And you know, my brother, my mom, my dad would, they would give me shit because they care about me. They're like, why are you doing the sales thing? Why are you doing that? And it's like, they didn't get it. You know, I went straight from high school into business, you know? And, um, and you, you, it, a part of it is just understanding. It's always the beginning because no one sees any results yet. The fastest way to shut anybody up is to show results. It's honestly the only real no BS way. You don't talk them into accepting it. You don't try to change them. You just go and do it. And then they will stop talking. It's pretty simple. It's exactly what happened um, as I evolved. But it is the beginning, those first couple of years, probably, that you're going to have the hardest pushback. And from people you love, it's going to be heartbreaking because you expect something from them. You expect their validation. So the fastest way to get over this, first of all, you, de- you detach completely from needing validation from anyone. Problem is 99% of entrepreneurs who start entrepreneurship are doing it to make a point. Not because they actually love entrepreneurship. That's a little deep. Mm. Mm. Doing it to prove something. Because they're doing it to prove something, their entire meaning of success is attached to someone else's opinion of them. <sighs> Bad place Damn. to be in. That's why it, it's discouraging. Because when mom turns around and says, you should go back to school, they go, Ugh, no amount of money will make her happy. So I got very lucky as well getting the president of Thinking or Rich, Satish Verma, to mentor me early on. Because... I was quite insecure when I started my business. I thought I was doing a lot, but he made me realize lots of holes in my, in my thinking. And I detached fully. I became a man very early. Again, I'm very lucky because I got that mentorship. I became a man because I detached from needing things from others. So one big piece is just not needing validation. To complete detach from whose opinion means what to you. Your opinion of you is the most important. I thought what I was doing was great. I could see myself as a good person for doing it. It didn't matter what anyone else believed or disbelieved in me. Even if they believed in me, it didn't matter to me. Because it's like, again, my opinion matters more to me than yours. The second thing, man, is understanding the person and why they're doing it. Sometimes when we understand, I'll say this, every time you understand something or why someone is a certain way, you completely get, you stop being reactive. Here is the, in a nutshell, why people criticize or naysay or whatever. It's simply because they don't believe it. That's all. So when they see someone attempting to break that this belief they have that it doesn't work or it's not possible, it frightens them. It intimidates them. And a great speech. I just watched Coach Carter again the other day. Great movie, man. Samuel There's a scene. Jackson? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a good movie. There's that scene where one of the boys stand up in the, in the basketball court and he goes, my greatest fear is not that I am inadequate. It is that I'm powerful beyond measure. And it's a really good speech. And you start crying and there's, there's a whole speech out of it, but there's one part in that speech where he goes, it doesn't serve anybody to dim our shine, to dim our light. And that by standing in our light, we are giving permission to others to do the same. And you, really, you hear that and you go, man, that's what entrepreneurship is. Of course, they're going to be afraid. We're, we're, we're turning on the lights in a dark room where they've been sitting their whole life. So when you shine, you better believe like moths to a light, you're attracting attention. That's why leadership is so important because if you don't have it, you won't make it. But it's important to understand that they're afraid and you 
are starting to diffuse that. So it's a scary feeling. It's uncomfortable because now you're taking them out of what they believe is true. Because if you make it, guess what happens to their belief? It's not true anymore. That's a scary feeling. They'd rather die. And that's why they criticize. They try to hold you back. They don't do it consciously. Most of the time they're doing it unconsciously as a safety measure. If it's your brother, your sister, or your mom, your dad, they're really just trying to keep you here so they don't have to sacrifice who they are by you proving it wrong. And so you got to just take, get empowered by that. In fact, if you do not have naysayers or criticism, you're not doing enough. If you're doing enough, you're doing it right. People will see it and will want to bring you down. And they won't want to. They're doing it out of fear. And when you understand that, you have compassion for these people. You don't have hatred. So haters, I don't call them haters. They're not haters. What the hell does that even mean? No, man, they're scared. They're my future clients. They're, they're going to be my inspired fans. One day they'll turn around like Armin did it. I'm going to do it. You know how many people from my high school made fun of me because I was trying to do network marketing? How I was the outcast, man. Do you know how many of those people reached out to me within the next four years when I started doing Reborn and putting out content around helping people? You know how many of them reached out to me depressed, wanting help, advice? Lots. Because they didn't think it's possible because their parents put in their head it's not possible. So they didn't try to go to, for their dreams. I was the only one that broke out. I'm like, screw everyone. I'm going to do it. Because I did it. They go, damn, it's possible. It's inspiring. That's what it is, man. It's just detaching from validation so you're not insecure. And second is understanding that they're just afraid. That's exactly what fear looks like. When, especially your loved ones, when you're trying to do something that they don't believe is possible. End of story. And when you know that, you gain compassion. You don't gain hatred. You don't try to prove something to them. Hmm. Bring me bring me your skeptics and I'll turn them into believers. It's funny you brought that quote from Coach Carter. I believe that's a Marion Williamson quote. That's one of the greatest quotes of all time. What's funny is I'm actually reading one of her books right now. I think it's called The Law of Divine Compensation. And it was a gift from our mutual friend, Elena. So I have that, you know, in, 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 oh. in my heart. So it's funny the... Uh, it's, it's funny how, you know, you have these coincidences that come up, right? You, you say a quote from an author. I want to write that down. Reading. The divine law, what is it? So the book I'm reading is, I think it's The Law of Divine Compensation, something like that, Marianne Williamson. And uh, I think that quote is from one of her earlier books called A Return to Love. Thank you. So she's amazing. That whole quote is so, so powerful, you know? Um I actually have a list of my favorite quotes and I have that one on there, which is pretty awesome. So uh, you're, you're also, all the things that you do, you're also the founder of High Ticket Coaching. What do you yeah. consider high ticket? And is this in reference to coaches offering services, products, programs, courses? What is this? Great question. So lo like logistically, high ticket is anything you're selling in coaching, uh, that's three to 10 grand or more. So less than three grand, not considered high ticket. That's more courses, information, maybe consultation, maybe one-on-ones. Um, and so there is a there is a mission behind why I bought that domain. It took me months and uh, a pretty penny to buy. It's quite a good domain, highticketcoaching.com. And I had a mission behind it. Um, I realized, again, internet marketers are teaching coaches how to do coaching. So coaches are now getting off path. Let me come fix that. Let me co course correct what's going on. I'm going to take all the internet marketing stuff we're learning, but I'm going to specifically filter it into a coaching business. So I can help coaches get their message out there and help more people by doing what coaches should do. And I realized one of the greatest tragedies in the coaching world, in the market, is coaches that are overworked and underpaid. Overworked and underpaid. For $1,000, they'll sell you 12 weeks of coaching, come over and clean your dishes. They'll, they'll take out your garbage. If you need them on call 24 seven, no matter what time of the day, you could call them. Like, How do I sign up for that program? <laughs> like, like that person, three clients and will die. Okay. It's not sustainable. So why is it? It's because of a lack of certainty in their own self, lack of confidence, man. That's why they undercharge. So high ticket coaching is not just about the money. Obviously it's about selling something that's over three, or I would even say minimum five grand. Cause that's what I think coaching in and of itself is a high ticket service, a premium service. Why? You're asking somebody to come into your life and make decisions with you. The only other person that gets that privilege is your spouse. And that's quite a costly commitment. It's called marriage. And so the closest thing to marriage is a coach. So you shouldn't sell it as if it's just flirting or a date at that price. That was a really good analogy. Might use it later. My point though, 
is that in and of itself, coaching is the most premium service you can get from somebody. It's next to mentorship and mentorship. You can't really buy. They find you. Anyone sells mentorship is kind of weird. That's not. Usually it's someone who's done something and doesn't need to do anything, just helping you out. Coaching is the next level. I've done this thing. I've gone through it. I learned how to fix it. I can fix it for you. Let me help you. I'm coming in to become a partner with you in your life that without marrying you. But it's a marriage, but through whatever uh, uh, market you're doing it through. So there is a mission statement behind this high ticket idea, which is this. I'm going to redefine what high ticket coaching is. It's not about charging more. You got a lot of people who inflate the price as well with no real, real reason why. High ticket coaching is about becoming a leader. What do I mean by that? You develop the confidence and certainty in yourself to stand not only with you what your worth is, but also to get that level of commitment out of a client. If you can get a client to invest five or $10,000 into themselves through your coaching, what are you doing to that person? Instilling belief. I've never, I, I, I can easily tell you in the four years of doing this coaching business, the clients that have got the most transformation are the ones that paid 10 grand or more to me. And there are fewer of them than the hundreds who paid less than thousand bucks, 500 bucks for something easily. Why? Because those ten thousand dollar clients are still to this day friends of mine. So they say if you don't you go, pay, you don't pay attention. Yes. Like when's the last time you bought a five hundred dollar course and transformed everything in your life? No. When's the last time you though you got if you ever have someone watching a coach to work with you over a period of time in depthly hands on with you? You change everything, right? I, I I've been struggling to to get into the shape of my my best shape of my life my whole life. Like I've always tried to. I didn't know what I was doing. The first time I hired a personal trainer, which is a fitness coach in sense, I started to see him three times a week. Guess what? I got the best results. I dropped 12 and percent body fat in just two months. My abs started to pop out. I got more muscle. I felt I was in the best shape of my life. What happened? What changed? I knew I don't access all the information online, YouTube. I kind of knew myself, but until I had committed financially to, I think it was like eight, 900 bucks a month. So it was like a seven to $8,000 package or something like that. High ticket package. Until I got that and I committed like that, I didn't get results. So there's a psychology behind being a high ticket coach and charging high ticket. It's better for the client because if the client's afraid to invest that kind of money, they're saying to themselves indirectly, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. Does that make sense? So there's a, redef- there's a definition I want to make behind it. High ticket coaching is about leadership. It's about becoming a problem solver, not a problem creator. And so you solve your own problems so you can solve others. And knowing those problems costs are usually higher than what you charge. It is much more expensive to stay where you're at in life than to pay somebody five or 10 grand for coaching. But that is something we need to teach coaches. That's why they sell for a thousand bucks, 1500, 500. Let me give you hundreds of sessions. No, no, real coaching, what Tony does, charges a million dollars, see him three times a week, a year. Why though? Because he only needs three times with you to give you that one shift that changes everything for you. That's his skill level. Charges $1 million for that. And there's a waiting list for two years. That's what I'm trying to get people to think. Think bigger about themselves. Think bigger about the profession and really bring more bigger commitment out of their clients. That's what high-tech coaching's mission is. That's why I bought that domain. I'm building uh, you know, my brand around that now. So we have just a few minutes left. So let's talk a little bit about Think and Grow Rich. Why should everyone not only read that book, but read it multiple times, study it, and uh, do, the, do the exercises and actually implement what's in there? Why is that such a special book? First of all, any book you read, you didn't read. You only read books you study. So unless you're studying it, it's use it's waste of time. How do you study a book? You read it slowly, not fast. You underline things. You have a separate notebook or note tab where you take notes from the book and you summarize. You read it back. When you're done the book, you read back your notes and read back the book again. And then here's the thing. That's just studying it. You know how you actually live it? Go do what it said. Millions of people have read Think and Go Rich. How many of them actually changed their life? Lots of them. But those people that did implemented what they learned. They actually read their goal every morning and every night, like Napoleon says. They actually became definite in everything they did. They actually created a mastermind that was harmonious and helped them get what they want. They actually overcame all the fears, the ghosts of fears in their life. They actually learned how to make decisions in their life. So... I'm going to just tell, tell you how it is. I would not be here right now if it wasn't for thinking Rich. Hell no would I be here. No way. 
no way would I have the most incredible team. I think I any man could be uh, grateful to have the four full-time staff I have. That's my team. I look at them as partners in my business. They're my mastermind. I would never, ever be able to be the person to lead these extraordinary group of individuals without thinking grow rich. With that thinking coverage, I would never been able to plug all the holes in my in my thinking, uh, heal all the insecurities I have, understand what it actually takes to become a person of leadership in life for me to get what I want. It would never, here's the deeper part, teach me how to connect to infinite intelligence. And see, 20% of um, 20% of what I do, it, it, you know, how I get my results is my doings. 80% is infinite intelligence. It's infinite intelligence is connecting to source. And that's what Think and Go Rich is about, connecting to source through a self-management system so you can accordingly, uh, congruently align yourself with that thing called God or source of the universe. It's a, it's a rule book of life. So to me, I'm like, if you're not reading it, you don't understand yet what a successful life looks like. That's a bold statement, but I'm telling you from experience, years now, I've been studying and living it. Even to this day, I'm almost finished reading Outward in the Devil all over again for like the fourth time. That got me out of depression a year and a half ago. Now I'm reading it all over again for learning how to maintain my success at the top, whatever the top means. You know what I mean? Because there is more dangers when you start getting success than there are when you're trying to get out of rock bottom. Outward in the Devil from the Point Hill, which is thinking grow rich, teaches you how to prepare for that. So I'm constantly a student of this philosophy. If you are not, you have no no roadmap to how to coordinate yourself throughout your life as you grow. I just don't, I don't, I genuinely, unless you do it accidentally, which happens less rarely, I don't see how anyone could succeed in things they have in their life without following these principles consciously. Because a lot of people do it unconsciously. Because that's the other thing. Napoleon didn't make up a philosophy. He studied it for 25 years and saw what was the philosophy. So people do it without knowing what thinking or rich is. But imagine now if you had your hands on the wheel because you consciously knew what the principles were. That's how I look at it. So this is my Bible looking version of Think and Grow Rich. You'll be proud of me. I just read it for the fourth time in a study group with 30 business partners. Uh, I took over 66 pages of notes. It's 24,000 words. And I created like a mini Think and Grow Rich manual that I can study right to the goods uh, and I've been implementing that. So uh, it's funny, every time I read the book, it's completely different. And the book is the same, but it's the person that's different every time that they read it and they get something else from it. So uh, my last question for you is, if you could go back to a 10-year-old Armin Shafi and you could whisper some words of advice in his ear with all this experience you've had now and, and, and the, the courses and mentorship and Think and Grow Rich and learning, all this stuff, what advice would you give your younger self uh, to become the person you are today? Just one thing, man. Everything's going to be okay. That's good advice. Do, do exactly what you're going to do. Everything's going to work out. Amazing. It's like if you love a flower, you don't touch it. You let it bloom. If I went back to my old seedling, I would tell myself, do exactly what you're about to do. And just keep remembering everything's going to be okay. It's going to work out. Where, uh, where, where can everyone find you online? If they want to check out your courses uh, on social media, if they want to reach out directly and, and stay in touch yeah. and see what you're up to. Um, so if you want to get content, some really cool stuff I put out is on my YouTube channel, Armin Jaffe. Um, you can also go to clear talk or Armin Jaffe, S H A F E E. Um, and you'll find my stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff there. I'm also open on Facebook. If you send me a message there, again, Armin Shafi. Um, and websites is just speakingclients.com or hightickitcoaching.com. Those are more of my trainings. But if you want to find me and talk to me, Instagram is my name, but the in front of it. So the Armin Shafi. Um, that's it. You guys send me a message. I'm always cool to have conversations. I don't respond right away because I'm super busy. But when I do, I respond, I connect. So I'd, be lo I'd love to talk to some people, watch this interview, tell me what you thought. That was uh, VP of Think and Grow Rich Institute, uh, creator of Speak and Get Clients and founder 
of High Ticket Coaching, Mr. Armin Shafi. So thank you for joining us on today's episode, everybody. Uh, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L and on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message and I'll see you on the next episode.